Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is for the months of April, May, and June of 2016. It's a series on the book of Matthew. And this particular lesson is on maybe the most, most famous part of the book of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount. It's lesson number three for April 16 of 2016. I hope that you have your Bible handy. We're going to look at some passages in the Sermon on the Mount and a few other places as well. But before we begin, we'd like to offer a word of prayer. Our wonderful Father, as usual, we need your guidance, your help. Send the Holy Spirit to lead in our discussion this time to help us comprehend what there is here in Scripture for us to learn. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In this lesson, we will discuss some of the major teachings of Jesus, not only in the Sermon on the Mount, but briefly touch Matthew 13, where he gives some other parables. Here's some interesting parallel to, just to, to kick us off. In the book of Exodus, we see God lead the children of Israel out of Egypt, baptize them, in quote, through the, through the Red Sea, bring them through the wilderness for 40 years, work signs and wonders, and meet with them personally on a mountaintop where he gives them his law. Okay? In the book of Matthew, we see Jesus come out of Egypt, be baptized in the Jordan River, go out into the wilderness for 40 days, work signs and wonders, and meet personally with Israel on a mountaintop where he amplifies this same law. Does that sound a little similar? Is that intentional, or has it just happened? What do you think? I don't think too many things are just happened. You think God planned it this way? Well. Well, I will go out on a limb along with a lot of other people, so I got, we got company out there. No other sermon given in history has had the impact on humanity that the Sermon on the Mount has had. But the sermon itself will not do us any good unless we apply it to our own lives. That's found in Matthew 5, verse 5 to 7. And I, you know, I mean, how many sermons have we heard on even a small portion of the Sermon on the Mount? We could go on, we could be speaking days and days about the Sermon on the Mount. So how are we going to handle this in one session? Well, here's a list of some, I just, I just thought, well, let me just make a list of the topics that are covered in the Sermon on the Mount. There's true happiness, there's greetings from heaven, uh, we'll talk about that in a moment. There's salt and light, there's teachings about the law, there's teachings about anger, adultery, divorce, vows, revenge, love for your enemies, charity, prayer, fasting, riches in heaven, the light of the body, God and possessions, judging others, Asking, seeking, and knocking, the narrow gate, a tree and its fruit, I never knew you, the two house builders, and the authority of Jesus. Wow. Well, Ellen White said these words, Desire of Ages 298, The Sermon on the Mount, though given especially to the disciples, was spoken in the hearing of the multitude. After the ordination of the apostles, Jesus went with them to the seaside. Here in the early morning, the people had begun to assemble. Besides the usual crowds, now notice who's there. Besides the usual crowds from the Galilean towns, there were people from Judea, even from Jerusalem itself, from Perea. Where's that, Gordon? On the uh, east side. Of the Jordan River. From Decapolis, where's that? East side. The east side of the Jordan River. From Idumea. Not Syria. That's way south, south. south. Of, 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 of Judea. Petra. Yeah, down where now would be, we call it Petra. From Tyre and Sidon, that's the northwest. The Phoenician cities on the shore of the Mediterranean. I mean, he's drawing crowds from all over the place. When they had heard what great things he did, they came to him to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. There went virtue out of him and healed them all, Mark 3, 8, and Luke 6, 17 to 19. 
Well, Jesus began his sermon by giving a list of the Beatitudes. What's a Beatitude? Anybody know what a Beatitude is? Oh, it's what is listed here. It's all a different section. These are blessings. Yeah. Yeah. The word translated at the beginning of each of most of those Beatitudes is the Greek word makarios. It's translated as blessed in some translations and happy in other translations. Um, and it really means happy, really supremely happy. And here's Ellen White's comments about that. The Beatitudes are Christ's greeting not only to those who believe, but to the whole human family. He seems to have forgotten for a moment that he's in the world, not in heaven. And he uses the familiar salutation of the world of light. Blessings flow from his lips as, a gu as the gushing forth of a long-sealed current of rich life. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing. Uh, that's in the introduction, page 7, uh, paragraph 3. So, he starts out his sermon by, let me bring you greetings from heaven, right? Even among non-Christians and non-religious people, this sermon has been praised for its ethical and moral standards. So how do you see the Sermon on the Mount? Is it, does it encourage you or discourage you? should be encouraging. Mm -hmm. meant to be. Is God calling us to an impossibly high moral standard just to humiliate us by proving that we can't do it? Mm. Or is this simply a call to a social gospel? Well, this sermon calls each person to, de to decide for himself or herself out of his own personal experience how she or he should interpret, should interpret the words of Jesus. And again, I quote from Ellen White, some very interesting stuff, especially in light of our last week's lesson. In the Sermon on the Mount, he sought to undo the work that had been wrought, I'm sorry, the lesson from two weeks ago, so what I'm thinking about, he sought to undo the work that had been wrought by false education and give his hearers, what's he here for? To give his hearers a right conception of his kingdom and of his own character. He came to teach us the truth about God, right? Yeah. The truths he taught are no less important to us than to the multitude that followed him. We no less than they needed need to learn the foundation principles of the kingdom of God. Desire of Ages 299, paragraph 3. So, the Sermon on the Mount tells us what God is like. It gives his hearers a right conception of his kingdom and of his own character. We have seen in previous discussions that to give an accurate and complete picture of the character of God was the whole mission of Jesus to this earth. If you remember, we looked at that a couple weeks ago. January, Signs of the Times, January 20, 1890, if you want to go back and look at it. So, once again, when you read the Sermon on the Mount, how does it strike you? What things come up in your mind when you look at it? I can't do this. I can't do <laughs> this, okay. Not alone. Asking too much? Well, um, she says right here that it was to tell them of the character of God. Mm -hmm. So now you're asking questions of, as if it's supposed to be our character. Well, that would be nice. Yeah, it'd be nice, but <laughs> is it? I mean, I mean, really, it isn't our character. It's God's character. Okay. How do we get? How do we become partakers of God's character? Well. Is that have possible? we gotten that far yet? Is it possible? Great Controversy 555.1. Five, five, five mm. By beholding, we become changed. Yeah. I read about How long that last does that week. take? The rest time. of eternity. And this process ultimately ends in eternal life. So yeah. if it's something that takes all eternity, then why, why are we asking, why is this discouraging? I mean, it's just like you want it to happen now. So it shouldn't be discouraging. No. It shall should I, be hopeful. <laughs> shall I give you an example? This happens to me almost every day. I had a young woman, early 20s, come into my clinic today. I've forgotten exact weight, somewhere around 300 pounds. 
And of course, she wants that weight to be gone now, right? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what a surprise. Have I ever heard that story before? So is that what you're trying to say, is that it shouldn't be discouraging because this takes a while? That's part of it. Right. Well, some Christians have suggested that whereas the Ten Commandments given from Mount Sinai were the law of God in the Old Testament, the Sermon on the Mount given by Jesus is a manifesto for Christians or a sort of law of Christ in the New Testament. Is that the true picture? They see the Old Testament as pretty legalistic, and now it's replaced by a system of grace. Does the Sermon on the Mount sound like grace to you? It's the same God, the same one, and uh, the, the, what was called the Ten Commandments are really a description of the way everybody will conduct their lives for eternity. So you're saying the same Jesus was on the Mount Sinai that's on the Mount of Beatitudes? Yep. And I remember there's a verse, I think, believe it's Malachi 3.6, that says, I am change. God and I do not change. And there's plenty of evidence in, in the Sermon on the Mount. Just take, for example, Matthew 5.17 to, to 19. Do not think that I've come to do away with the law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets. I have not come to do away with them, but to make their teachings come true. Does that sound like he's trying to get rid of the Old Testament? Remember that as long as heaven and earth last, not the least point nor the smallest detail of the law will be done away with. And what law was there in the days that Jesus, that Jesus was speaking? Old Testament. Only the Old Testament. So, where are we going to go with this? Well, is there any evidence that people operate on the same kind of principle in the Old Testament? There had to be a few, but thinking that the Old Testament has the law mm -hmm. for a reason, and then you have the, the Sermon on the Mount, had, there has to have been at least a little bit of growth, because if they'd done the Sermon on the Mount, the first... Back in Zion, yeah, yeah. yeah. They switched them up. They wouldn't, have, they wouldn't have been able to understand it. Yeah. Okay. Look at this. Abraham. Genesis 15, verse 6. What does this say to you? Abraham put his trust in the Lord, and because of this, the Lord was pleased with him and accepted him. Does it sound like he understood what it was all about? Let's, let's try. And another way you could say it, Abraham took instruction from the Lord. Because mm -hmm. okay? all through the Old Testament, the complaint is, hey, you're not listening. You're not following instructions. You don't want to learn. Well... And we just said that the idea of, uh, even of the Sermon on the Mount is that you obey God. So what do we read in Genesis 26, verse 5? I will bless you because Abraham, he's talking to Isaac now, God speaking to Isaac, I, I will bless you because Abraham obeyed me and kept all my laws and commands. And obey, my understanding, the word obey comes from the Greek, which means a willingness to listen. And you don't want to listen and take instruction from somebody that is not trustworthy. Mm -hmm. So you have to spend some time educating yourself and checking things out. In several places throughout Scripture, starting 2 Corinthians, Isaiah, and James in the New Testament, Abraham is called a friend of God. What does that tell us? He's also held up as a great example of faith. <clears throat> does a friend of God, is that a good example of a faith? The results of faith? Sure. What does faith mean? A willingness to take instruction and become persuaded. Mm -hmm. It's a persuasion process. And what method does, they, does God use? He uses evidence and words, mm -hmm. which are symbols of ideas, and expresses those. And it takes time to get through the well, dam of, of yeah. false, uh, or actually becomes a prism of our uh, preconceived ideas, and it takes a lot of unlearning to do. In fact, faith is just a word to describe a relationship with God, isn't it? As with a friend. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. I think faith is believing that the truth is the truth. Well, faith, belief, trust, persuasion, all comes from the same confidence, all comes from the same word. 
Look at Matthew 5.20. He's barely getting started with this sermon here, and he says, <laughs> I tell you then that you will be able to enter the kingdom of heaven only if you are more faithful than the teachers of the law and the Pharisees in doing what God requires. Is that a great way to start out? <laughs> they all understood it, I think. <laughs> <laughs> You're giving them a lot of credit, but yeah, I think they probably had a pretty good idea. Yeah, but why? Why would you do antagonize teachers of the law and Pharisees that were there? But I think they'd been fleecing the general populace for a long time, one way and another. Well, what kind of righteousness did the scribes and the Pharisees have? Whatever it was, Jesus sure condemned it in Matthew 23, starting at verse 13 and following. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So he was not complimentary. Oh, we'll really? get to that later. <laughs> the righteousness they had were, was righteousness in their own eyes. Yeah. That's the kind of righteousness they had. Salvation, on the other hand, has always been by faith. Any time we just... And by the way... There's a lot, there has been a lot of discussion about justification by faith, especially. But we hear about justification by faith, we hear about sanctification by faith, we hear about righteousness by faith, we hear about salvation by faith. What's the common term? Faith. Faith. We do the faith part and God does all the rest. Why is that complicated? Well, he came here to teach. And Paul, remember in Romans 5.10, he says, we are healed, so we're, many times the word is translated as saved, by his life. And what he's saying is study Christ's life and you'll change your thinking. Mm -hmm. And it's our thinking that needs healing the most. Salvation has always been by faith. Anytime we discuss the actions that result from faith, and someone has said very wisely, I think, faith works. Not faith and works, but faith works. It, it makes a difference in our lives. It changes us. So if faith does everything else, what exactly is the everything else? Well, if we have a trusting relationship with God, He will take care of the justification, the sanctification, the salvation, the righteousness. We don't have to spend years trying to define the careful, the very clear distinctions between justification and sanctification and righteousness and salvation like so many scholars seem to think they need to do. It's really the teaching that he has. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's not some magic formula. It's not gonna, God's going to go in there and, and he's finally got the combination. He's going to twist it and lock it in a position. It doesn't work that way. It's purely teaching. It sounds like all he's doing is giving you a ticket. No. That's the ticket for salvation. He'll give you a ticket. No, it's purely... Well, you said he gives you this, he gives you that, gives you this, gives you that. Well, but by what? By having a relationship. Does that mean... I mean, if you, you, you had a relationship with your wife, or you still have, I hope. Yeah. Did that happen in five minutes? Well, it Is seemed like a... it did at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, 30 years later or more. <laughs> I, I, hope it, I hope you got more of a relationship than you had in the first five minutes. Uh, so, but I mean, this is the point. If God is talking about a relationship. And a relationship, it takes time. It takes, I mean, you know, like you say, it, you may be very impressed in five minutes. That could be true. I was very impressed my wife, by my wife the first time I met her. As so, well. so... How do you know when you've got that relationship? Do you have well, a t-shirt on that says relationship? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, let's talk about this a little bit. Anytime we discuss the actions that result from faith, so in other words, one of the ways that, that we know that there's real faith is that it makes a difference in us. It makes a difference in our attitudes. It makes a difference in our actions. There's a tendency to creep into legalism. You start saying, well, look, look what this relationship with God is doing for me. Don't I look pretty good? The Pharisees had perfected legalism. Their religion was a religion of hard religious orthodoxy, destitute of contrition and tenderness of, or love that left them with no power to preserve 
the world from corruption. That's extracted from Thoughts from Not Blessings, page 53. Mere outward forms can never save us. Only faith that works by love. And again, love is another word. How does that work? Without coercion, extortion. Mm -hmm. Gives evidence, tells stories, teaches. Well, one of the best definitions of how that all works is found way back in Micah. Micah, who wrote six, what, seven, 700, almost 700 years, 700 years before Christ. Micah 6, 6 to 8. What shall I bring to the Lord, the God of heaven, when I come to worship him? Shall I bring the best calves to burn as offerings to him? Will the Lord be pleased if I bring him thousands of sheep or endless streams of olive oil? I mean, imagine, endless streams. Shall I offer him my firstborn child to pay for my sins? No, the Lord has told us what is good. And here's what's going to be the result. What he requires of us is this, to do what is just, that would be what is right, what is righteous, to show constant love and to live in humble fellowship with our God. Magnificent okay. statement. Gary, that's, that's what it's all about. So now we come to the Sermon on the Mount, which is really what this is all about. We come to a very challenging passage. Um, let me just read, there's three or four verses here. Let's start with verse 43. You have heard that it was said, love your, fellow, love your friends, hate your enemies. Sound familiar, right? But now I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may become the children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun to shine on bad and good people alike, and gives rain to those who do good and those who do evil. Why should God reward you if you love only the people who love you? Even the tax collectors do that. And if you speak only to your friends, have you done anything out of the ordinary? Even the pagans do that. You must be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Wow. What does that mean? Another way I've heard it says you are to be perfect or you may become perfect. As a, it's an offer rather than a command. That's well, good speed said. Yeah. Good speed said you are to be perfect. So that can be taken both ways. And, and look at this. God, and, and by the way, that's, that's the Greek. God's ideal for his children is higher than the highest human thought can reach. What does that mean? God's plans for you are, are better than anything you can possibly imagine. Just think about that. Unlimited. So to Unlimited. Say. Okay? Be therefore perfect, even as your Father in, which is in heaven is perfect. This command is a promise. The plan of redemption contemplates our complete recovery from the power of Satan. Christ always separates the contrite soul from sin. He came to destroy the works of the devil, and he has made provision that the Holy Spirit shall be imparted to every repentant soul to keep him from sinning. The tempter's agency is not to be accounted an, ex an ex excuse for one wrong act. Satan is jubilant when he hears the professed followers of Christ making excuses for their deformity of character. It is these excuses that lead to sin. There is no excuse for sinning. A holy temper, a Christ-like life, is accessible to every, repent, to every repenting, believing child of God. Desire of Ages 3.11, paragraph 2 and 3. The Greek in Matthew 5.48 is very interesting. It can, read either as a sub, can be read as a subjunctive command, you must be perfect, or as a future tense, you will be perfect. Both are spelled exactly the same. It just so happens in that particular word, both the future and the subjunctive uh, you know, are exactly the same. Thus, Ellen White got the exact meaning of the Greek without ever having studied Greek. How did she do that? That's pretty good parallel with what, the way the Ten Commandments are written. Mm -hmm. uh, in the Hebrew, it's, it's a description of the way yep. the universe runs mm -hmm. without people being self-centered. You will not and, do this. You will yeah, not do that. Yeah. Or you don't do this. You're not doing this. Or you won't be doing stealing and killing and so on and so forth. So what did Jesus mean by this perfection in Matthew 5, 43 that we just read? What, what does that mean to be perfect? It means to be mature. Mature. 
mature is the word. Wow. And that would be ripe? Like a plant? Like Perfectly a tomato? Perfectly ripe. You can get it overripe. Appropriate so. for the age. Appropriate for the age, okay? Look at Luke 6, 36. This is another example. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. That's the way Luke put it. Real Christians will demonstrate the kind of love that Jesus himself lived. How would that happen in 2016? How can we show the kind of love that Jesus showed? Does that mean you stop on the corner where the guy's holding a, maybe he's half drunk and he's holding a sign, please give me money or please give me work? Preferably money. Hmm? Preferably <laughs> money. So yeah. I, I don't understand the question. You well, just I, I, you mean I, you mean you just give everything ever give everybody everything? No, you no. you can't do that because then you'll take away people's potential reward for accomplishing something on their own efforts. Well, that's nice of you. <laughs> I think well, you, you can donate you, to to entities that are looking after these kind of people. Yeah, it's better than you trying to figure it out. Sometimes I think. But there were times when Jesus fed the 5,000 and he's fed yeah. the 4,000. Yeah. What's wrong with that? Nothing. But they didn't become Another dependent upon of the it. loaves and the fishes. They sure wanted to be. Yeah, but they, they, contrary to the way things are meant to be. Well, is this the first time we've been called to be holy? Be therefore perfect. Look at Leviticus 19.2. To say to the community of Israel, be holy because I, the Lord your God, am holy. Is that the same as Matthew 5.48? Or you're not sure? Sounds the same to me. Look at 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16. Instead, be holy in all that you do, just as God who called you is holy. The scripture says, be holy because I am holy. Quotes from Leviticus. So it's absolutely essential that we recognize that God would never ask us to do something or to accomplish something that He cannot accomplish in us. But that is exactly the point. It is only by having the right kind of relationship with Him that He's able to work in our lives to accomplish what needs to be accomplished. Only He can do it. Where does He do it? In us. In us. But you can only do that if you have the interest, the desire to be more like God. I mean, yeah. God gives us a choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, a little bit later in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew seven twelve, there's an interesting expression. Look at this. Do for others what you want them to do for you. This is the meaning of the law of Moses and the teachings of the prophets. Okay, so... Uh, Where's that in the Old Testament? Basically, it's the Ten Commandments. As you read through the Old Testament, does this pop out at you? Well, that, that verse there is a little more distilled, don't you think? Into the, getting to the point. Whereas the Old Testament, you kind of have to dig a little bit. Mm -hmm. I mean, how many people reading and studying the Old Testament would obviously come up with Matthew seven twelve? I think it'd have to be pretty hard. Well, let me take something from the Old Testament and let me see let me you can tell me whether this is the same or different. Look at Proverbs twenty four twenty nine. Proverbs twenty four twenty nine. Don't say I'll do to him just what he did to me. I'll get even with him. Now, I'm sure you were all saints when you grew up, but did anyone ever say to you, your mom ever say to you, don't hit your brother if you don't want him to hit you? <laughs> or sister. What's the difference between Proverbs 24, 29 and Matthew 7? 
It looks like it's just one's a negative or the other, right? Yes, definitely. Is, is, is there a real difference? How, how, how are they different? I'd say there's a different in, difference in attitude or paradigm. The concept is different. Well, this more, time around, it, you, can, you can go get them. Mm -hmm. uh, Proverbs 24, uh, 29 is more proscriptive, and in the other text we're quoting is uh, more uh, Matthew 7. descriptive. descriptive. Yeah. Right, it's more, uh, more, it's, it's turned uh, around, it's yeah. more specific. Mm -hmm. Well, Proverbs 24 is, 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 I think every mother says this to their kids, if there's more than one in the family. That's a very common expression. Basically, what Jesus said is, do unto others what you would like them to do to you. How is that different? Think about it. That's a whole different world. Yeah. We all did it and we'd have a happy world, wouldn't we? Wow. Yeah. Um, there's a very subtle difference. If, if everyone did to others, instead of not... See, one says, don't do to others what you don't want them to do to you. This one says, do to others what you want them to do to you. Right? Those are very, very different. It sounds like it's just an inverse. It's, it, superficially, but think about it. See? Well, why? Why would that be inverse? Because you end up uh, uh, wanting to do what you want somebody to do to you mm -hmm. but at you, the you same think, time you don't want that person to do something to you so you shouldn't do it to them mm -hmm. so basically I, one's talking about doing bad things to people and the other's talking about doing good things to people the first one is like a street thug that got hit I'm gonna go get him and mm -hmm. if he's lucky, he'll only get hit. There's probably going to be more than that. Mm -hmm. well, the second one is much more peacemaking. How many so-called Christians are look forward to the day when God's mm -hmm. going to get the pound of flesh out of yeah. their, their, enemy. soul, their <laughs> enemies? You see, it's uh, <laughs> that's not the bright spirit to harbor. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but if you want a pound of flesh from that person, you're going to have to think about that person getting a pound of flesh out of you. And that's still going to do the same thing, is to, to, to even out between both of you type of thing. I mean, to, to not put yourself self above that person. Mm -hmm. There's no forgiveness in that, in that paradigm. Yeah. And when Jesus says, forgive. Well, I wouldn't say that. The second one, in effect, disavows any further but that trouble. <laughs> <laughs> this depends on the way you think. Okay, we're going we're to take a moment and jump over to Matthew 13. There's a whole list of parables in Matthew 13. And why did Jesus start talking in parables over Matthew 13? Do you remember? This was to fill. His eyes were out. All this Jesus said to the crowds in parables. Indeed, he said nothing to them without a parable. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. I will open my mouth in parables, and I will utter what has been hidden since the foundation of the world. That's Matthew. Or, yeah, Matthew thirteen thirty four. Okay. So, why is he doing that? Some said so that the religious, pious frauds leaders of the day wouldn't know what he was okay if you hear these parables let me just read a couple the kingdom of heaven is like this a man happens to find a treasure hidden in the field he covers it up again and is so happy that he goes and sells everything he has and goes then goes back and buys that field okay okay is it is there a pretty clear message in that i would say so yeah but who gets the message <clears throat> you have to you have to draw your own conclusions about it, right? Jesus isn't drawing any conclusions for you, right? Look at the next one. Also, the kingdom of heaven is like this. A man is looking for fine pearls. And when he finds one that is unusually fine, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that pearl. So he goes on, and we could go on here. The point is, in these parables, what is Jesus doing? He's telling stories, right? 
and he's not he's not telling you how you how to interpret them he knows how you're going to interpret them but he's not telling you how so they can't condemn him you can't condemn somebody right. for telling a story right wait some people have been condemned for jumping to conclusions well and, that's a, uh, that's another story completely but but you know if you take it that way why is it that the good people know <coughs> what it is and the bad people don't the bad people know, but they just can't pin it on, on Jesus for saying something politically incorrect. Mm -hmm. Are you yeah. sure? But I think oh, be sure. There's a very good, very good example of that over in Matthew 22. We'll get there eventually. I think also the peasantry in general understood quite well. Well, d d let me just ask you this. Yeah. If, if he was hiding it from other people so they couldn't get after him, how would he say it differently that, that would expose him to that kind of a, um, danger? How well, would he say it straight okay. out? Okay, if, <clears throat> here he's saying, if he, what he should be saying, if he's stringing it down, he says, if you're looking for what's really important, you're going to come and follow me. You're not going to follow the scribes and the Pharisees. Okay, so what are they going to say? Grab that guy and... <laughs> wait a minute, wait a minute. Yeah. I don't get that from those parables. You don't? No. Absolutely. I get way more than that from that. Well, but I'm just, you asked just for a simple, straightforward explanation. Yeah, what but Jesus that's is saying, what I'm saying. If you do that straightforward explanation, it'll be a narrow explanation. Well, that's fine. So, that's, I'm not No, I, I think that's the big point right there, is that to do a narrow explanation like that is not as good as doing a parable that does a broad one for different people. That's fine. It, my point is also true that if you tell a story, you can't be condemned for it. I think that is a side. But we're that, probably, that is a, we need to look at well, the conditions. It, let's go back and read the words, that, the words that... He, Jesus used parables to tell all these things to the crowds. He would not say a thing to them without using a parable. He did this to make what the prophet had said come true. I will use parables when I speak to them. I will tell them things unknown since the creation of the world. What's he talking about? But, but, isn't, but listen to that, what it's saying there, that he's uncovering things that were unknown. There's no way you can uncover these unknown things by doing those narrow things that you're talking about, these narrow explanations. I, I'm not, I don't think that that verse from the Bible there is telling him that, that he's doing a secret code so he won't get arrested. Well, okay. <laughs> yeah, well. Okay, our relationship with God must come to be the most important thing in our lives. That is not easy for naturally selfish human beings. There are two main points in the first two of these parables. One, nothing must stand in our way, preventing us from obtaining a right relationship with God and thus an entrance into the heavenly kingdom. Two, uh, yes? Uh, we shouldn't leave that uh, last subject, and that was at Mark uh, 4, starting at verse uh, 11. Mm -hmm. And he said to them, To you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see... Mm -hmm. but not perceive, mm -hmm. and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn again and be forgiven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, my second point here, those who have actually obtained that priceless possession recognize its absolute value. I think those are the two really big things we need to get from that. Well, think about what Jesus is saying in all this. Look at John 14, verse 6. How does this fit in? Jesus answered him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. What's Jesus trying to tell us? Father's a little bit hard to go by. <laughs> to go to? Well, to go by, mm -hmm. because the Father is very big. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. We live in an age where absolute truth is considered old-fashioned at best and dangerous at worst. Why is that? Can we nail it down a little bit? See, 
If your life is guided by principle, you might not just do what all the rest of the crowd is doing. You might be different. You might be upsetting the apple cart. You're not going along. Right? Absolute truth is dangerous. So our world is saying, no, we're not, we're not going to go with the absolute truth. We're going to go with what's politically correct. Which is just the opposite. But how do you get to the place of that absolute truth? You have to start. The only source of absolute truth, of course, for a Christian is Jesus Christ. But how do you get to that point of making that relationship with Christ to have that ultimate truth? Well, that's a daily experience. Yeah. has to be. So there has to be something that gets you to the... I mean, <laughs> this is kindergarten versus eighth grade. Yeah. You know, they got to start somewhere. Yeah. Well, the clearest thing we have about... Uh, God about God and the way He runs His universe is the four Gospels. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, we need to use that as an overlay, as a prism with which to draw the truths out of the rest of the Bible. And there's some things in the rest of the Bible that are pretty tough to... But then, like I say, uh, we, we had Matthew 23, where He condemned the scribes and the Pharisees. The, and all we have is what, what's been handed down from, from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. uh, but God, the spirit of truth speaks to our mind. That's the only, remember he says, they got to leave so that the comforter can come to you. And, and uh, there's no, God can't force it on you. It, it takes time. Well, we've looked briefly at the Sermon on the Mount. We're not quite finished with it yet, but what would it be like to live in a world where everybody practiced the Sermon on the Mount? That would be heaven. Mm -hmm. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Yep. Well, it should be quite clear that the Sermon on the Mount makes love the basic principle of the kingdom of God. What do we know about love? That's well, some what God of, is. Yeah. Some of the famous verses are 1 John 4, 7 and 8 and 16. Dear friend, let us love one another because love comes from God. Whoever loves is a child of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God for God is love. And then if you drop down to verse 16, it says, um, God is love. Well, and we ourselves know and believe the love which God has for us. God is love. And those who live in love live in union with God, and God lives in union with them. That should be pretty straightforward. You put Romans 2, 14 and 15, when those who do not have the law do what the law requires, so that the law is written on their heart, and the law is love. I mean, even though they may not have had the, all the, the writings and the books and everything, but if they do what is right and follow the... So, how would you describe this love between us and God? Is that a special kind of a relationship? A friend of mine described what love, uh, that Jesus came here to show us what love is, show us how to love, and how much to love. Mm. And you go all the way to death. The last drop of blood is dying is, is how much. The, and, and when you do that, you're not self-centered. You can't be. Well, let me, let me expand on what you just said. Would our lives be significantly different if we really exhibited that kind of love? In fact, if we always did what love is, we wouldn't sin. Exactly. That's pretty, yeah. if you think about it, if you always do a thing in a loving way, you can't sin. Jesus said some very interesting things about that the night before his crucifixion. You remember? John and John 15:35. And my Bible doesn't want to go there right now. Give me a second. Well, it doesn't like something about this. Um, I'm sorry, it's 13. Uh, 
Let's start with um, verse 33. My children, I shall not be with you very much longer. He's talking to his disciples in the upper room. You will look for me, but I tell you now I, what I told the Jewish authorities. You cannot go where I'm going. And now I give you a new commandment, love one another. Is this the first time he said that? That's all the way back in Leviticus. How is that a new commandment? And it's something he can't make you happen. Can't force it. Can't force it. Okay, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Now that's new. See? He, he said, love others as you love yourself. That's from the Old Testament. But no, he says, no, I want you to love as I have loved. That's new. And what happens if we do that? If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. W what does that mean? We're talking about the Sermon on the Mount being an example of love. What does this mean? If you have love for one another, then everyone will know that you are my disciples. And as this has and as his disciples, their job was to go out and tell the rest of the world this mm -hmm. gospel of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. and, and who's doing it? Not the infinite one on it. He has to use finite beings in time and space to do it. Well, let me, uh, let me just ask, put the question sort of the opposite. How many other people is Jesus implying are out there who really love? Not, not, none without being in harmony with Jesus. He's saying, if he's saying... Everyone will know if you'll stand out like a sore thumb because you love each other. That means nobody else is loving each other, right? We're, we live in a world that's motivated by selfishness. And what happens if you jump in that world and you, you're motivated by love? Is that why it just appeals to a remnant? What a surprise. You know, I get confronted by people all the time that tell me that I know atheists that are very loving people. Mm -hmm. Why would that? So, be? so um, I have my answer to that. But um, what would be your answer? Well, let's think about that. Uh, Satan would love nothing more than have his people be, look like they're Christians. And maybe even act a little bit like Christians. You may be... Well, they say they may that do these it. people they, are very loving, that okay. they do all kinds of things, and sometimes that they're sure that they would even give up their lives for them. Well, and maybe, maybe they're closer to Christians than they think. Well, or maybe they're just agnostic that don't want to be bothered, because there's very few they, really well, true atheists. And there's a lot of people... There's a. Yeah, I heard a guy recently said, there's no such thing as a true agnostic. Everybody's either a Christian or an atheist. That's yeah. <laughs> well, an atheist, if you define atheist as somebody that says there is no God, that which is a lie because he can't prove it, a believer could say, hey, I, I can't prove that there is a God, but I can look at the evidence and come down on the side that there is. An agnostic, I would define as somebody that doesn't want to be bothered in wrestling with the evidence. Yeah. But there are also other people, I know people who, who, act, who do a lot of very loving things because they want people to like them. Well, I'd like people to like me too. Is that a selfish motive? Well, I, it depends what selfish is in that case. <laughs> Come on now. <laughs> well, You're selfish is kind of now. selfish is kind of a broad thing. You can be everybody can be accused of being selfish. Sure. Even Ellen White was accused of being Everyone selfish. Even be and she was of being. she was knocked for a loop for a while. She's the people accused her of doing things for her own purposes, and she wondered, you know, if that was true. Uh, I remember reading this thing. You know, it's amazing. The Bible says everybody's a sinner too. What a surprise. And remember, he says, well, look at all the things we did for you. Yeah. He says, go away, I never knew you. We were never friends. Well, you're getting off the subject here. You're talking about mm -hmm. that I was waffling around what, what selfish was. Mm -hmm. and, um, and that's my point right there, that it is a kind of a simplistic term yeah. that, um, that needs a little more depth to it. Well, here's a, here's a 
challenge. This is from our Bible study guide. This is actually from uh, the teacher's section of the teacher's Bible study guide. What is life is a question that has preoccupied humans throughout history. Long ago, Socrates told the youth of Athens that an unexamined life is not worth living. What does he mean by an unexamined life? Anybody have a look inward? Hmm? You never look inward? Right. You, you, you know, you look at yourself and say, you know, what am I doing here? Okay, after some examination, the Nobel Prize winning Indian poet Rabindranath Tagore wrote, I slept and dreamt that life was joy. I awoke and saw that life was service. I acted and beheld service was joy. The Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard, on the other hand, seemed somewhat puzzled and exclaimed, life was not a problem to be solved, but a reality to be experienced. While an Indian mystic of recent vintage exclaimed, life is a jar of mixed pickles. <laughs> <laughs> Shakespeare gave vent to the meaninglessness of it all when he said, Life's a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so have you ever been inclined to agree with any of these philosophers? As Christians, we believe that the only way to have true meaning in life is to have a relationship with Jesus Christ and to learn to live as he lived. In this sermon, the Sermon on the Mount, Christ was expecting Christians to live lives blessedly, responsibly, and lovingly. Well, let's look at those. As we suggested earlier, Matthew 5, 1 to 12, is a call to supreme happiness or blessedness found only in God's kingdom. He was using, remember, the greetings from heaven. Okay? At first glance, being meek, mourning, etc., does not seem like the path to happiness. But a real Christian is meek and merciful, poor in spirit and pure in heart. He mourns and thirsts. He is a peacemaker and is at the same time persecuted. But in all of that, his relationship with God makes him happy. I think about the story of, <clears throat> of um, the pastor of the ancient church of Smyrna. He had been in church for in, in the days when it was against the law to be a Christian. And finally, they, they, they caught him in a, in a farmer's house outside the city. And they said, okay, we'll arrest him and we're, we're going we're gonna to take you and, and either burn you at the stake or feed you the lions. And what did he do? He said to the farmer's wife, feed these people. They're hungry. The soldiers that came to arrest him. Meanwhile, while they're eating, he's standing over the corner praying for every Christian he can think of in his whole area, pray for, praying for all of them that they would that they would survive, not be, not be discouraged by his death. Incredible. Try to imagine yourself sitting among the crowd listening to that sermon when it was first given. Would you have thought of any of the conditions described in the Beatitudes as be, as making you happy? Remember that the word Macarius is sometimes translated blessed and sometimes translated happy. As crazy as it might sound, those who come to live by the Beatitudes as Jesus spoke them will have the happiest lives of all. The Sermon on the Mount also calls us to live responsibly. What do we mean by that? Christians are to be not only the salt, but also the light of the world. What does salt, what does salt do? How is it used? Preserves. It makes things taste better. Okay. Um, you put it in something and it disappears. You can't see it more anymore at all. It, it just diffuses itself completely. It's, it's there, but it makes itself felt by, its, by the, uh, the way it impacts the taste, right? Like you said. By contrast, what's light? If, if light disappears so you can't see it, it's useless. It has to be stuck up on a hill or you don't put it under a basket. You put it out there so everybody can see it. To do some good. So in what way are Christians supposed to be salt? And what ways are they supposed to be light? That can't be too... I mean, you must have heard lots of <laughs> sermons about this. Well, to be salt, we're supposed to be mixing with people. 
so we get to know them and we have a chance to influence them. Isn't that what it's all supposed to run for the hills? Not supposed to run for the hills, not yet. Aren't you supposed to <laughs> so stay away from those people? <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> and light, how is it used? What does it do? It shines out, tells everybody the truth, lets itself be known. Well, in the next section of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus used an interesting form of address to expand and emphasize the requirements of the moral law. It was said... But I say, what's he, what's he implying? He's explaining things. Is he, is he saying I'm doing away with the moral law? No. Not at all. I'm expanding on it, right? He raised the standard very high. And to the point of you know, loving your enemies. I mean, how is anybody supposed to do that? And that last section is to Christians are supposed to, supposed to live lovingly. Have you ever tried to love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you? Is that a recipe for self-destruction? God never asks us to do anything which is not for our best good. Becoming more like Him is, in fact, the best thing we can possibly do for ourselves. I'd like you to think about something as we close. We're all hoping to go to heaven. What are, what's going to happen when we get there? Who, do we, who, who are we going to be living with? We're going to be living with people, different people, from all kinds of different cultures that lived down through thousands of years, and we're supposed to get along with all of them perfectly. You think we might need a little practice at doing that? kingdom of heaven is at hand. Mm -hmm. We need a lot of practice and getting along with people who don't see things the way we do. It, we're not all going to turn into cookie-cutter Christians when we get to heaven. We're still going to be who we were and who we are. So God is calling you out there and us here to become more like Jesus. And that means to be loving to all that we associate with, which isn't easy, we know, but that's exactly what the Sermon on the Mount is asking. Our kind and wonderful Father, there's no way you can summarize the Sermon on the Mount in a few words like describing the Pacific Ocean as a, a puddle full of salty water. But nevertheless, um, we appreciate these opportunities, this opportunity we've had to briefly touch on some of the mo major points in the sermon. May we become more like you is it through our contemplation of these things is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.